One of the most striking aspects of Berserk comes right down to this idea of fear and the fear that lies within all human beings. Not only does that concept play directly into the lore of the story, but also is something that gravitates people to the stories that tend to delve into the darker subject matters like Berserk does. Berserk is a manga where you are not safe. It is not a manga that ignores the darker sides of human nature and plays into that very aspect, pushing the limits of how far we can take a character and still want to be willing to follow their journey and be on their team. The fears associated within Berserk touch on a variety of topics, starting with the most basic of the horrific designs of the apostles, monsters, and demonic creatures that look like something straight out of a nightmare. But it also focuses on the internal conflicts of the human condition, showcasing that we all have darkness inside of us, and sometimes it's that inner darkness, those thoughts of destruction, our inner beasts, that are far more terrifying than the monsters around us. I wanted to take a moment, especially considering it's October, the month of Halloween, to focus on the things in Berserk that we can consider the most scary or the most horrific, and what it is about them that keeps us intrigued and coming back for more volume after volume. Berserk is mostly classified as a dark fantasy story, being its genre, but wouldn't be too far off to attach the horror label to it as well. In fact, Dark Horse actually does that on the back of their manga volumes. True, Berserk is a manga meant for adults, and its subject matter has themes of overcoming trauma, what it means to love someone or not let go of the past, and what anger, rage, and our inner darkness can do to us as people. All this is basked within a backdrop of medieval fantasy, wars, and monsters beyond our wildest dreams. With each turn of the page, we may find ourselves within the comfort of two characters fully embracing and accepting one another, or we may find ourselves transported into a hell dimension with no way of escape, helpless to watch our favorite characters fight desperately against the inevitable. I think when talking about the horror of Berserk, we have to start with the most basic, and that is the creature designs. Kentaro Miura has come up with some of the darkest, most macabre, strangely sexual, and gross to look at monster designs of any manga that I've come across. Most of the apostles in the story which we know were once human and now have a form that more or less represents the darkness that was in them and their evil personified, which I don't know what was going on in the Snail Apostle's life to make this happen, but I still contend he's probably one of the strongest apostles out there. There's probably many inspirations for his creature designs, but the most obvious one being that of Devilman, which Miura has cited as an inspiration for his manga. This disturbing, grotesque, and unnatural looking creature designs that feel like they should not exist its anatomy making no logical sense to human understanding. Other inspirations seem to may have come from artists like H.R. Geiger. I'm not sure if Miura has ever mentioned this, but Geiger was responsible for famously creating the Xenomorph design that was used in Alien, and oftentimes his artwork have a very sexual undertone, with everything looking like a phallic dick or a gateway that looks like a vagina. Considering we got dick monsters later on in Berserk, it could be that it's not far off of an inspiration. We also have influences like H.P. Lovecraft to thank for some of the mythological monster designs. The entire Sea God segment of the manga felt reminiscent to his stories, and the Cthulhu vibe was not far off. And let's not forget about the God Hand themselves, who were subtly inspired from the Cenobites of the Hellraiser series by Clive Barker. I actually did a whole video about all of the similarities between the God Hand and the Cenobite, so if you want to check that out, that will be linked in the description below. But essentially, you have creatures from a hell-like dimension of existence that are called into being when a device activates. And the Cenobites focused on delivering an experience of pleasure mixed with pain combined, as the God Hand gave you a large benefit, but only by sacrificing your ties to humanity. The designs themselves also feature characters that seem to have been tortured in some way, and whose appearance now represents what they looked like upon the time of death or that torture. Void specifically looks this way, and even his matter-of-fact and direct form of speaking is very reminiscent to the way that Pinhead speaks. At least, in the first movie. Please, for the love of God, do not watch the sequels. It's also fascinating to me how every apostle, essentially every demon in Berserk, was once a human. The concept being that all evil stems from humanity. There are no true demons, it was all by design of what humans needed. They needed evil to exist to justify why bad things happen in the world, and then every evil act they partake in as humans 
sort of amplifies this idea of evil lurking within all of mankind. The scariest factor being that we did this to ourselves, that every human being is capable of evil and darkness, and given the choice and circumstances after enough struggle and enough despair, we all reach a breaking point where we would rather choose to escape trying to be human. We can't do it anymore, and we can't live in this awful world filled with these awful people, that the only response to the dark world around us is to become even more awful ourselves, to embrace our inner darkness and evil, which in turn makes the overall world even darker. It's a slope that continuously goes downward, and there is seemingly no way to stop it. We also have the other monsters and creatures in Berserk, such as trolls, ogres, giants, hydras, which are all classical mythological creatures and which Miura gives his unique spin on. I particularly love his take on trolls, having them be these small, nasty, furry, and just rambunctious groups of rascals. No, they're seriously fucking nasty, and they're like a swarm that invades small towns and take over. These creatures were originally only from human dreams and fantasies, but that fear the human subconscious makes them real. Traveling from the world of idea up through the layers of the astral world, they are manifested into existence. But again, because people need evil and darkness to exist, then the horror becomes that all these creatures, all this darkness, all came about by human subconscious fears. To the point now in the manga where we have an entire world overrun by fantastical beasts even ending the chapter saying mankind's desire has been realized. Even if it's something you're scared of, deep, deep down, you want it to be real. But besides the fears of the astral world, we also have the fears within the world of man. With the idea of evil being a thing, we then have humans who, by and large, want to be perceived as good. We have an excuse for what's bad, so now it's time to project how good I am to show that I am not like that. Enter the Holy See a monotheistic worldview religion that holds people very accountable for swaying away from God. It's that religion everyone must accept and embrace, and the crime for heresy is certain death or worse. Bringing in various real-life historical torture implements like the Wheel of Torture, which would tie a person to the wheel, break their limbs one by one, and then often just hang them out to rot while taking days before they would eventually die. Mosgus in the story serves as the scary, delusional zealot who believes that he is righteous and doing good things by torturing those who disobey the teachings of his god. This is a terrifying aspect of the story that is relatable to real life as well because you know that if someone truly believes that what they're doing is good, then they are far more likely to justify horrible actions in the name of that good. As Mosgus battles Guts on top of the Tower of Conviction, Mosgus has no idea about the idea of evil or the God Hand or how apostles work. He truly thinks he was blessed by God and is saving the people of Albion by doing what he's doing. The Conviction arc itself is the perfect part of the story to show the horror and panic within the eyes of the masses, that people are unable to do anything but comply and beg desperately for a savior believing that burning a woman alive is somehow going to help them, and that by running towards the falling tower, hoping for God to save them, instead of running in the opposite direction to save themselves. And all of their collective desires and desperation brings forth the savior they all wish for, which is Griffith. Physical horror is also ever-present within Berserk. The threat of violence is very real. When characters are injured, they stay that way, and there is also this controversial topic of the sexual violence in the story. Not to delve too deep into that in this video, I'll save that for its own someday. But yes, the thought of being taken advantage of physically and abused in that way against your will, without consent, is something that Berserk talks about. And despite some people misreading it as pure shock value or Berserk being misogynist, Berserk actually handles the idea of sexual violence in a very adult and intelligent way. It deals with the repercussions later in life. It deals with the vulnerabilities and trauma when it comes to a sexual relationship. And it deals with what it can do to someone's mental status and the trials and tribulations to bring somebody back from the brink. But also with the understanding that they will never be the same way as they were before. Lastly, I want to talk about the fears and horror of inner darkness. Like I said earlier, we all have the capability of darkness within us, and I think Berserk showcases us a very interesting dynamic within the main character, Guts. 
Guts is not perfect, he's not a superhero, and he's made a huge amount of mistakes. We all have dark and negative thoughts, and those thoughts are amplified by trauma and stressful situations. Guts, having the childhood that he did, having watched all of his friends die in horrific ways, having to watch the man he looked up to do what he did to Casca, and all of the battles and war that he's experienced. It is no wonder that he dons a persona of being a standoffish, irritable, and cold-blooded person. Add that to not being able to get a good night's sleep because of being constantly haunted by demonic entities, and then later having to take care of and protect Casca, who at the time has the mind of a toddler, and in this constant reminder of everything that went bad within his life. Now I'm sure we all have had a time where we are irritable, we're underslept, and maybe we say something that we regret, or we snap at somebody that we didn't really mean to. And after you feel better or come to your senses, you think, that wasn't me. I, I would never say that. Why did I do that? Well, that was your demon. That was your beast of darkness. Now put that on the scale and level of things that Guts goes through, and we get a point where Guts almost assaults the woman that he loves. It's what sparks in him the motivation to gather a group of people to come along with him, scared to be alone with himself, scared to be within his own thoughts. Thoughts that tell him he'd be better off if Casca was gone. Thoughts that lead him down a path of becoming nothing but a vessel of vengeance and completely disregarding his humanity. The same capability that is within everyone, and Guts is perhaps the most inspiring because if there is anybody who should want to throw away their humanity at this point, it's him. But he doesn't. Guts represents that struggle. That struggle against fear, against the horrors of the world, and against fully giving in to that darker nature that we all have as humans. We don't read Guts' story because he's perfect. We read it because of how flawed he is, how he makes mistakes, and how he proceeds to come back from the worst situations, and how he takes on that damage and owns his mistakes. He doesn't shirk it off onto anybody else, but instead continues to walk even with his scars. And I think there's something special in that. That no matter how horrific the world around you or within your own mind may be, you get up and you keep fighting each and every day, no matter what. It's not about winning the fight, it's about the fight. Anyways, thank you all for watching this Halloween slash horror themed Berserk video. Tell me what you think is the scariest or most horrific aspect of Berserk down below, or perhaps just the scene that scared you the most. Also, please like this video and subscribe if you haven't so far. I would love to hit 75k by the end of the year, so if you could help me get there, I would really, really, really appreciate it. That would be awesome, guys. Thank you. Also, check out the links in the description for my Patreon and merch store if you want to support the channel on that extra level, as well as all the various social media links where you can follow me. Other than that, guys, I hope you all have a wonderful day and a happy Halloween, and I'll talk to you next time.